Thank you for that very generous introduction, Derek. I mean, I think the, the first thing that should be said is I, I spent um, the last few days reading um, a lot of Casey's work that um, has been printed up so wonderfully. Um, his column on the case in the College Hill Independent. Um, reading these sort of incredibly vibrant, you know, takes on March Madness, the Curse of the Bambino. I mean, what else did he write about? The, oh, the NBA Slam Dunk Contest. You know, it's, I was looking at myself. I mean, this is what I did four years earlier. I went to Yale. I wrote a column. It's called The Ez Files. Not quite as clever. Um, but I also wrote about the NCAA tournament and the Slam Dunk Contest and the Red Sox. And getting deeper into these articles, then you started to see someone who was really using the world of sports as a vehicle through which to discuss, explain, and, and see the world. And, you know, it was hard not to, you know, see a kindred spirit. Um, I only, I think this is right, Derek, I asked Ruth this earlier, I, I, I think I only met Casey once, I think I was 14 or 15, and he must have been 10 or 11. But even then, I sort of understood that connection as far as um, his energy and his interests. And when I was reading his columns, and you know, there's one line, I think he, he wrote a column called More Than Just a Game, and he talked about his connection to sports, and he said, I'm paraphrasing, it's, it's, it's a way of life. It's, it's sort of what I know, it's what I love. And you know, it was clear that you know, using the lens of sports to, to try to um, figure out who he was and explain the world was something that I shared. Um, when I look at his writing, you know, I see someone who clearly had a passion that he was going to follow. And yes, he wanted to be a sports writer, or maybe he wanted to be a play-by-play -play announcer. These are ambitions that I once had as well. Um, I don't know what his feelings were when he was at Brown. I know when I was at Yale, you know, another sort of nice, good school with proper people who were going to go on and do very proper things. Being focused on sports and writing a sports column wasn't exactly the thing that sort of everyone around you did. And it wasn't the thing that you sort of thought that there would, you know, in the end there would be much value in, in sort of spending time doing. And I know that in standing here now where I am with whatever successes I have, you know, for me, you know, I share it with him because there is little doubt um, just, I mean, it's amazing that the impact that I could have, he could have with me just reading his words and I didn't even know him. Um, and so there's no, I share whatever success I have with him. You know, when I left school, and there's a lesson in sort of, again, reading someone's words filled with so much passion. Um, when I left school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, you know, the idea of standing here with whatever's happened in my life, it's sort of amusing to think that I left school and it was, okay, what now? I had a, I had a love for sports. I had an interest in writing, um, maybe TV and the movies, like to travel. Um, but in essence, I was going to leave school and I didn't, I had to figure something out. You know, I was surrounded by all these people who wanted to be doctors and lawyers and actors and bankers and, and many of whom knew that before they even got to school. It's something that I was amazed by, just as I'm amazed today being around peers who are filmmakers and they have known they wanted to make films since they were a little kid and they've been preparing for this moment. And so in that way, you know, I've always felt a little bit lost, you know, compared to my peers. Um, but, you know, when I, when I left school, the, but right before I left school, I got sort of, um, I got notice of a, a job opportunity with uh, the CBS television network and the job opportunities in the career services office. And it said, um, be an Olympic researcher travel around the world, Olympic, uh, interview all the Olympic athletes, be responsible for all the background information that went into the, that would go into the broadcast of the games two years later. And I thought, oh, yeah, that, would, that would work. Okay, I'm gonna, I, I might want to do this. Um, 
the problem was there was about 2,000 other people who had that same idea. And I said, all right, that's fine. Um, I'm going to submit myself to this process. And, you know, it was by far, you know, in the last having now, this was 22 years ago, the most grueling job application process. There was multiple interviews. There was written tests. There was current events tests. There was history tests. There were sports quizzes. There was, they even brought in a, a real life Olympic athlete to have us interview right in front of them as a test to see how we interviewed people. All this thing, and you know, and and you know, luckily in the end, I was fortunate enough to be chosen one of the few. But when I look back at that experience, you know, even now, sort of something dawned on me, and I was smart enough to realize it then, which is, yeah, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, yeah, I really wanted that job. But the only way I knew how to sort of get to the place of getting that job was to be me and to sort of really focus on the things that I knew I was interested in and not necessarily what these people wanted to hear, which in that sort of case would be what, frankly, I would have guessed my inclination would have been. Um, but when you ask these questions, a lot of it was personal, a lot about the things, the way you see the world, that sort of set me off in a path of understanding that even in these environments with people who I, that were strange to me and were in sort of, you know, these uh, fancy structures that I knew nothing about, the only way to sort of maintain uh, yourself in your equilibrium and in move forward is to trust who you are and your instincts uh, at every point. Because even if you got into a position where someone said, yes, you can do this, but it would be on their terms, it wouldn't work. You'd be miserable. And so how, how I arrived at that place, I don't know. But it was one of those moments where I felt relief for a second, but the other thing that was sort of, it was wonderful to have some entree in the world, um, but it was two years of my life, and I was going to be back at square one, and that's essentially what happened. Um, it's funny that Derek mentioned a Marvel comic book story, because now apparently I'm telling my origin story, which is the only good part of Marvel movies, um, and the answer is Black Panther 2, by the way. Not, not really. Sorry. Sorry. Um, but, you know, it, it was around that time. And it's, it's, you know, I didn't know who I'd be talking to. I didn't know many students would be here. But it's sort of I've been thinking a lot about sort of the idea of, of, you know, a path and sort of what it was like when you're leaving here and thinking that you have to have it all figured out. And the fact is, like, there is no path. And, you know, I'm very much proof of that. You know, I had no path before I got to that job, and when I left that job, I was similarly disoriented without any sort of sense of what to do. Um, I felt the same pressures that everybody else would have in terms of, should I go to journalism school? Should I go to film school? Um, I had no sense of what that experience had bought me. But looking back, what I sort of understood very quickly is that what that experience bought me were certain things very fundamental to who I became very quickly, which is it gave me an opportunity to, within this sort of bigger corporate structure, there was four of us who are researchers, and then we, were, we were sort of tasked with a lot of responsibility. And so we not only were responsible for writing every biography of every athlete that, that would be in the Olympics and potentially on TV, which is hundreds if not thousands of people, um, you know, that's where I started to learn how to tell a story. And you started to get these reps, and you started to understand, oh, OK, so this, uh, you, not every story is the same. Not every story should be written the same, thought about the same. And the only way to sort of get to a point of, of learning a craft is to have the opportunity to do it over and over again. That was the official sort of work we had to do. The unofficial work we had to do was that we got to write something called an Olympic Journal, which was sort of an internal newspaper. And that was where four of us who were 22 years old got to just sort of write however we wanted to about the experiences we were having traveling around the world, interviewing these athletes, going to these events. And that was where, whether I realized it or not, I was really starting to find a voice. And I think that there's, you know, sort of looking back on this um, path, if there is one, of, or this challenge of being a creative person um, in our culture, you know, there's the path of how am I going to eat? How am I going to sort of make a living? And, and that's what you're always sort of seemingly focused on in the moment. But there's also this other path, which is how am I going to get better at what I do? How am I going to hone my craft? How am I going to find my voice? And that's a lot trickier. And that's sort of the thing I feel like I'm much more sensitive to when I think about 
um, you know, anyone who's in school now and who's young who's trying to, to make their way as a writer, as a filmmaker, or what have you. Because I was very fortunate to be in these, um, and I'll, well, I can tell you what I do now, but I was very fortunate to be in these institutions where, yes, I got to make a living, but I also got to learn on the job how to do these things in, in a way that, to tell stories, and to tell stories over and over again, that I think if I were so fixated on a, on a dream of I have to one day, I'm gonna be a filmmaker, I have to one day do that, I don't know where that would have taken me. I think I might have spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to gain access to a system, how to gain access to a person, how to gain, instead I was fortunate enough to actually do the thing over and over and over again, and incrementally along the way I started to figure something out and get better at what I was doing. I mean, it happened that after that job ended, you know, there's the other thing of I didn't know what I wanted to do, there is no answer to what you should or shouldn't do, and sometimes the answer is maybe the thing that has a little, holds a little interest for you, makes a little sense in the moment, you, you do that because you have to do something. As long as it sort of assigns, you know, sort of has some import into um, what may come next uh, in a purposeful way. And I, got, I, was, I was fortunate enough to have someone come up to me and say, hey, do you want to work on a TV show producing stories about Olympic athletes? Um, it sounded great, but I had never been on a TV shoot. I had never, you know, interviewed anybody with a TV camera. I had never sat in an editor room. I had no idea what I was doing. But if someone was dumb enough to let me do it, <laughs> I was fortunately smart enough to say yes. And, you know, it was a miserable place to be in terms of the place that I, it can remain unnamed. But it's the same notion. I was given this leash to sort of learn creatively on the job and to do these stories over and over again that slowly and subtly I just got to learn who I was, what I was good at, what I was interested in. All of these things at the time when I was sort of much more, um, I think, still focused on the big picture, still focused on what I wanted to be when I grew up, that, you know, after a few years of, of being so consumed by that and being so depressed by not being able to figure that out, I started to sort of understand that, oh, maybe everything I'm doing um, informs wherever I'm going to go, that there is no real destination. And, you know, subtly, slowly and surely, the burden of trying to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up fell away. The torture stopped. And the patience, which I am woefully inadequate in having, I have no patience, um, you know, thankfully had been um, sort of replaced with real-world responsibility that sort of distracted me from the, that bigger thing. But it took me, frankly, I'm, I know I'm, this is a very winding thing just telling you my story, but it wasn't, frankly, until you know, 10 years after I graduated from school and I was working at HBO um, that I was fortunate enough to have an opportunity to make a documentary. And I had sort of, at that point, I had been working on a show called Real Sports, the magazine show with Brian Gumbel, and I was doing, by the way, it's a similar thing. I got hired to do a job, and all of a sudden I was doing something, again, I didn't know how to do. I figured it was sort of, you fail a couple times, you figure it out. You know, I've been very fortunate in that way to have people seemingly um, letting me, you know, giving me opportunities to do these things. But when this opportunity to make a film about the Brooklyn Dodgers um, arose, which was, you know, I wrote a my senior thesis about a Negro League baseball team in Pittsburgh in the 30s, like my interest is race and sports and, you know, and society and, you know, that team, it was about the social and economic effects on the Hill District, the, the Pittsburgh Crawfords in 1936. Um, and when a story about the Brooklyn Dodgers came along that was about the integration of baseball and Jackie Robinson and it's about economics and city politics and the borough of Brooklyn and what happened and the heartbreak when this, this team left, you know, it's like these moments where it's happened a few times where these opportunities come up, and if, if nothing else, it's all about sort of recognizing the serendipity and the opportunities when they're in front of you. And they, they, were, they let me produce this documentary, and that was the moment where as soon as I started doing it, I was home. I sort of, it, it had taken 10 years. I didn't even know I wanted to make documentaries for a living or make movies, but this was the first time that I was doing something that fit um, it was what I wanted to do. I knew how to do it even though I didn't know how to do it. But the notion of sort of spending this much time thinking, crafting, reading, 
um, about this subject that ultimately would beget interviewing athletes, politicians, writers, what have you, in service of putting together this narrative, it was what I was built for, and I didn't even realize it. And so in that way, sort of someone like myself who has very little patience, I sort of understood how um, lucky I was to have my patience rewarded in finding this thing. And the last 10 years have been sort of relatively, you know, much more peaceful because I've gotten to work doing in this sort of um, arena that is very much in line with who I am and very much in line with who I was when I was in college. I think to, I don't want to talk for so long because I'm, I'm sure people here would rather have me talk about OJ. Um, <laughs> I'd rather listen to Derek talk about OJ. Um, you know, but if someone, if someone came to you, came to me um, in college or someone came to a friend of mine who knew me and said, by the way, I think in 20 in something years, you're going to make a movie about an athlete and it's going to be about race and sports and the law and celebrity and class and that's going to be your thing. I think everyone around me would be like, yeah, that sounds about right. You know, I didn't know that that was something that was possible at that time. And so to, you know, arrive at a point 20 something odd years later without knowing what you wanted to do but sort of end up doing exactly what it really you're supposed to be doing is sort of a it's quite a head trip but I think it in the end it just speaks to all these sort of you know and thinking about all this you know all the platitudes are are true in terms of you know being professional working hard but most importantly sort of being yourself and staying true to sort of your interest and in, you know it'll it'll work out I I actually believe that Granted, I've had two decades of experience to let me feel that like that's the case, but I think it's true. Um, and there is no, again, for everyone who's an aspiring writer or filmmaker, and I know how hard it is to um, break into an industry, but especially in this day and age with sort of a lot less sort of where these structures have been broken down, I think that focusing on the craft and what you do and in line with that, making sure you're working on these things that are passionate to you, you will find an entry point to the world that I, I believe. Um, so I have no idea how long I talked. I know I'm supposed to talk for a certain amount of time. Do I have to talk more, Derek? No, you did really well. Uh, so, but yeah, now I want to talk about OJ or anything else anybody else wants to talk about because I do better with a discussion. There are questions and there are students. So why don't you guys just raise your hand, let Ezra identify. Um, and why don't you say who you are? Just Hi, my name is Wallace. I'm a sophomore. Um, I'm in the English department. And I kind of have two somewhat related questions. Obviously, I think a lot of people want to know this, but what made you kind of tackle the mammoth that is the O.J. Simpson trial? Like, there are a lot of great sports dramas, but none quite like that and then in conjunction with that for a documentary um especially one as long as this like how long is your research and compiling process i mean aside of just filming and kind of like how long filming itself takes it takes so much longer with a real life story that's a good question um well the first question is why i took it on which is i didn't want to take it on they asked and i said no um and i said no primarily because i didn't really um, I lived through it. I was in college at the time, and I didn't think there was anything more to say. I sort of was very aware of the conversation. Frankly, I was very tired of the conversation. And, you know, as a filmmaker, it was, what's the point of spending this much time doing something if there, I wouldn't be able to add to it? Um, but what convinced me was the canvas that was being offered. I was um, approached about making a five-hour film, and I was as interested in the formal challenge of figuring out how to make a five-hour film as I was in what it was about. Um, and then when I thought more about OJ, what it means, you know, actually it spoke to everything I was interested in. Not about the trial itself, not about the murder, but everything that came before. I mean, OJ's story in terms of who he was, where he came from, going to USC, what that place was in the late 60s, the juxtaposition of that place with what was happening in Los Angeles. These are sort of fundamental to the things that I, you know, sort of thought about when I was younger and continued to think about. And so I thought, well, here's a story about the city of Los Angeles. Here's a story about 
a migration of people to LA, here's a story about the police, here's a story about, there are things that I'm happy to explore. Um, and I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to make a film that long. And those are the things I need to motivate me to do anything. And so that's primarily why I took it on. I mean, as far as the, the research part of it, you're right. Um, I was saying to someone earlier, like, there is, I think there are people who make films where if someone, um, you know, were tasked with, you know, making a film about OJ, you know, they might be really excited and eager, and they might sort of pick up the phone and call Marsha Clark the next day and say, I'm doing this thing, and just, like, start that process. Well, that's, in my mind, not quite the way to do it. I mean, I spent four months just reading and thinking and reading some more and thinking some more and writing the thing out as I saw it and trying to find my own connections within these disparate stories. And that's what I did before I ever picked up the phone, before I hired anybody to work with me. And so for me, it was really trying to think out this, what was going to be this mammoth undertaking because it was all about the architecture and the point of view because I kind of instinctively understood if I were going to approach anyone, I had to be so buttoned up in, with my approach that it would have been in sort of a non-starter with all these people who I sort of instinctively got did not want to participate in anything like this, which was borne out through the process. So that's it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. I was, um, oh, tell them who you are. Oh, hi. Um, I'm Celine. Hi, Celine. Rizzi, a film student. Currently, I'm a year off to focus on film. And I was changing uh, my path for documentary filmmaking. And I was thinking about, uh, I was actually just listening to the podcast and about the writer strike happening right now in LA. And it was like, it's 2017, duh, TV is like a cool thing right now. But I feel like non in the nonfiction world, it hasn't caught up until right now. Like the OJ thing was the first long form mini series documentary. Um, whose idea was that? How did you come? to say that it needed to be five hours? And also, how do you think it could translate to smaller formats, such as indie uh, filmmaking, because I assume you have a large budget, but um, how did you create an architecture in which the entire thing had an arc, but then each episode had to have an arc as well? So, so <laughs> that's funny. No, 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 that's, that's fine. I, uh, so again, I, I was, so weirdly, you know, the credit goes to a guy named Connor Shell, um, who, um, was one of the, the people who started the 30 for 30 series at ESPN, and he had an ambition to sort of do something that was bigger and different. They had made sort of maybe 85 to 90 films, um, you know, some of whom were done by um, Professor Zemblis' sons. Um, and so he approached me with the idea of the five-hour conceit, but nothing else. And so as far as how that played out, you know, it was totally, I was totally left to my own devices of how to sort of create the sort of that architecture. And frankly, I had no idea how to make, like I said, I didn't have any greater sense of how to make a 50 hour film. And so five hours is a long time. And I just sort of started to work my way through what I thought was important to understanding the story on a, on a greater historical contextual level. But knowing that, you know, I want to tell a story about what happens afterwards, but I'm going to go back to a certain place. I sort of earmarked what would be a period of time which I kind of thought was kind of primarily to be 1965 to 2015. Um, and then, but the specific structure sort of, I sort of chuckled when you talked about the episodic structure because I didn't create it with an episodic structure. I created one long movie that got split up very mechanically because it had to air in five parts. And so uh, that, if, it, if, if, some of those, if some of the parts have three act structures, <laughs> that sort of was, I don't know if completely incidental, but I guess fortunate. Um, we sort of built it in three parts. We sort of built it as three hours and everything that came before the trial, everything that went up through the trial and then the last part. And then we sort of did some fancy um, mechanical manipulation at the end. Um, and so, no, the focus was just trying to actually tell a story with the greater arc than un with individual specific arcs. And so it's hard for me to speak to sort of nonfiction episodic storytelling in that same way, though I know from the chronology of it, it, it sort of fit naturally um, within that structure. Um, you know, it, from the standpoint of, you're right, the budget is, you know, that's, no one's going to start off, you're not going to be like, I'm going to make 
this movie about OJ that's going to cost millions of dollars in archival um, licensing fees alone, like that's a non-starter if you're doing it on your own. So you need the backer of a network like ESPN. Um, but at the same time, the way this was done was sort of done with this sort of weirdly, you know, independent spirit of how I did it. It was there was no sort of structural oversight as far as how I should do anything. Who I was, you know, it was go make the movie you want to make. And so with that, I would like to believe that with, um, you know, networks like Net Netflix and Amazon, which are in the sort of content um, business to the point where because they're building their own libraries, if they find an idea and a filmmaker that they trust, they have money that they're going to spend to, you know, for these types of films. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, and that's sort of what is happening. I think there has been an evolution in terms of what type of programming that people want to fund, you know, whether it has to do with this, whether it has to do with making a murder, what has to do with the jinx, but there's been sort of, and granted all of those um, examples have to do with the murder. And so maybe there's a sort of weird salaciousness and people sort of, there's a belief that only stories that have to do with you know, true crime in some form are those that can hold that sort of people's attention span? I don't know. But I already know that Netflix and Amazon are commissioning very, you know, much longer doc series. Why that is, I think it's because, yeah, it is, whether it's in vogue, but people clearly have an appetite for it. So I think that's just going to be where we're going for the time being. If that answer, I don't know, does that answer any of your question? Um, I thought that other people talked about it. Um, I was just thinking about, like, I think a lot of people enjoy the episodic story because you can you can take a longer time with characters, you can build deeper empathetic bonds. Um, and then especially with documentaries, I feel like they themselves are things that need more contextual time. They need a little bit more of that research. So being able to expand it longer into these smaller chunks feels almost just beneficial to documentaries. Because um, as you said, you had have, you have a lot of contextual um, the whole reason why you did this is you want to contextualize it more and you wanted to go deeper. And to do that, you need a little bit more time. And so I'm glad that episodic is in both now because we can go deeper into these topics. Right. And what I can't answer, though, and which I've thought about and people have asked me about is every story is not created equal. And I know that this is a story that has sort of had such fascination in our culture. And what was missing was the context and the history in terms of how we absorbed it. And so it was very necessary to me to have the fullest impact to tell the story, especially because of the relationship that we already had to it that was imperative in terms of how this film was done in this way right now. And I don't know, and actually my fear is that people are going to say, look, this thing is really good. It's eight hours long, so let's just start commissioning eight hour long films. And I'm not so sure I'm going to be lining up to watch a lot of eight hour long documentaries, I can't lie. You know, I think that some context is necessary and more context in often cases would help. But I think it really is dependent upon the story and the richness of it and the necessity of it. That the story should always drive um, the format. Uh, okay, I just this is working. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Cormac. I'm a junior history concentrator in Professor Reedy's sports writing class. And I was curious, um, could you tell us about something that shocked you? during the information gathering or interviewing phase of the project? What if I said nothing shocked me? <laughs> does that make me unshockable? No, but it does answer the question. No, I, I mean, <laughs> uh, I, honestly, what I think shocked me, and this is going to sound like a push to your answer, is that for as reticent as everybody was and were just flat out reluctant to talk, um, once they talked, they talked. So it sort of it wasn't like oh no you know leave me alone and then get him in a chair and then they were shriveled up and like you had to you know beat these right. answers out of them you know people have been holding a lot inside for 20 years and that sort of we were able to gain as many people's trust as we did to sit and do interviews um, in the end once we did them I think the the most shocking thing was how open people were how forthcoming they were um, even when in sort of instances talking about things that I, I sort of understood that they knew might not come off in the most positive light to a certain section of, you know, an audience in a way that I very much respected. And so I think that was the great, the most shocking thing. I mean, I don't know that I learned, I mean, again, that's, everyone says, what did you learn? You know, it's hard to separate what you learned throughout the whole process. 
I mean, in a very to be, you know, and maybe this is not going to come as a surprise. I mean, I mean, the only couple things that I think shock me, I was t saying this earlier, I was actually shocked when I saw the crime scene photos for the first time. Um, it was probably over a year into the process of me working on the film, and I was being given a presentation by Bill Hodgman, who is the deputy district attorney who's in the film. And it's part of the process of him getting more comfortable with us. Uh, we had a meeting with him, and he took us through this presentation he gives, and um, and at the end of it were these photos. And it was like I was sort of snapped into a place that I, you know, I had sort of been become inured to the whole story. And that really crystallized the, you know, sort of for me, you know, again, what had been lost or missed with the way that we absorbed and covered the trial. The brutality of that crime and sort of what it was was sort of so stark in my face that I knew that that needed to be included in the film. So that was one moment that I would say shocked me. Um, you mentioned contextualizing the story within LA and the Rodney King riots. Um, I was wondering, like, I see a lot of parallels to DC where I know you're from, I am too, and I was wondering how that informed like, your experience growing up in DC in the 90s. And they just like informed the film. Yeah, well, the funny thing is, um, growing up in DC in the 80s and 90s, I mean, again, it's hard to sort of understand what sort of what affected you in terms of what sort of is very basic to your existence. Um, I'm sure, you know, again, who I am, the household I'm in, the city I'm in, sort of is form fundamental to what I was, you know, how I tell stories. I think that, um, strangely, um, the Rodney King beating is much more of a sort of seminal experience in my mind, even though I was a high school student in Washington, D.C. Um, when that happened, it was sort of, again, you know, I lived a rather sort of coddled existence, you know. You know, I spent a lot of time in different parts of the city, you know, playing, you know, playing ball, doing different things, you know, but my day-to-day -day was sort of, you know, pretty cushy. And so the image of, you know, an unarmed black man being beaten by police uh, was shocking and sort of, you know, I wasn't a rube, I understand, and I understood very clearly um, what the world was like intellectually, but that I think hit me emotionally and sort of shook me out of a certain innocence that I had. And it was borne out by, I went to a Quaker school, and in, and in Quaker schools you have a meeting for worship, and meeting for worship is a thing where you go to every week and the whole school sits there, and, you know, every, anyone who's moved to speak can get up and talk. Um, and a lot of weeks you sit there in silence for 50 minutes or however long the class period was. And that was the, the only memorable meeting for worship was the meeting for worship after that video came out. And the expression of, of mostly, mostly black students but talking about their experience with that and coming to grips with what had happened and how they were seeing the world and that had a profound effect on me. That it happened to be something that um, is so sort of necessary to the context of understanding what was happening um, with this trial a few years later was coincidental? I don't know. Um, but sort of, you know, the idea of that's what I sort of think of more than sort of what DC was like, you know, because when I think of what DC was like, despite it being, you know, the murder capital of the world in the 80s and having a mayor who, you know, smoke crack and, you know, I don't know, you know, uh, that's, that's harder for me to say. I wish I had a better answer. Yeah, I was gonna, your, what, what were you reading through your research on L.A.? Because you started the series really getting deep into the, the L.A.'s formation. What were some of your influences, what you read? Oh, um, you know, one, you know, one book immediately comes to mind is a, is a book called Official Negligence, which isn't exactly about L.A., but it's about the LAPD. And it's about the history of the LAPD, written by a guy named Luke Cannon, who was a Washington Post reporter, and he wrote this 700-page tome about that history, but also having to do with, you know, sort of all these fraught incidents and the dynamic between um, the police department and the community. Um, I mean, I read sort of things all over the map that might sort of inform you know, I, I read some things, and some of them I'm not going to remember the name, but it's like, you know, David Thompson's books, you know, like Beneath Mulholland uh, Drive, like things that have to do with, like, anything that sort of 
would speak to LA from all these different, through all these different lenses or things that I was engaged by, you know, sort of. And so I'm trying to, now that I'm, you know, then because I also got waylaid very quickly by, you know, there's, there's not a shortage of text when it comes to, when it came to the trial itself. And, you know, actually it's funny you say that, the weird thing that doesn't exist is there are a dearth of books about that migration to Los Angeles, which is things I was, there was a couple books that I frankly can't remember that I read that weren't very good. And I was struck by the lack of literature um, in that regard. Um, yeah, I'll tell you later when I think more. Derek. Uh, yeah. Well, there's students, but okay. I'll throw it out. Okay. Uh, part of the OJ story, of course, is about celebrity in America. And we all know who you were, but now you're kind of moving into this category. Ne next, qu next question. <laughs> <laughs> Is, did, did you are you reflecting it all back on that thinking about it making the movie of now how you're in this position and you're not uh, you don't have to answer I, I mean no not in those terms no certainly you know and, and whatever sort of very small level of attention that I've um, gotten because of this in um is nothing comparable to what his experience is. So I'll choose to have that be my pat answer. Hi, um, <clears throat> Milan, I'm a grad student in English. It might be a tricky question to answer, but you, you're in this really fascinating position where you have sort of in the same year two long accounts, the O.J. Simpson trial, one sort of rigorously documentary, one you know, ambiguously fictionalized. Um, and I'm wondering, sort of from, from the perspective of you know, the creator, are there things, I, I assume that you saw the FX show. You right? shouldn't assume things. <laughs> Fair. You haven't seen it. But I can answer your question. <laughs> I guess the question, the question is sort of with that as, as an outside metric. Um, are there times that you felt the constraint of documentary form? Are there things that you think are problematic about fictionalizing this story? So how do you see those two? Um, sure. Um, you know, I, I actually said something about this um, earlier, and anyone who's in the room, I apologize. Um, I, didn't, I didn't watch it for a couple reasons. One, because I know the story. Two, uh, I was you know, and it was it was a little sort of personally challenging to sort of work on a film of this length and to, you know, put all that sort of blood, sweat, and tears into it, and then halfway along the way be like, oh, someone's making a 10-hour TV series about the same thing. You know, what are the odds? And, you know, I just sort of were we were afraid it was gonna, you know, suck up all the OJ oxygen. Um, and the truth is, and this is going to be try to answer your question, there were things that I was afraid or I knew that they could do, dramatizing that I couldn't do in documentary form, you know, so one thing I was talking, I, you know, is, you know, first of all, Chris Darden was the one person probably realistically that I thought I might be able to convince to be in the film who I couldn't, and he was the one member of the prosecution that I wanted above all else. You know, I didn't think that it, frankly, anybody necessarily would talk, but I thought if I had to have one, it would be him, and that he wouldn't participate in knowing that, you know, there's this fascinating dynamic with him as a character and his relationship with Johnny Cochran, and I knew enough about the TV show to know that that was a dynamic that was fully explored and could be dramatized and nuanced and actually have characters having conversations. And I, it was almost too painful for me to try to, to want to watch something that I knew I couldn't access myself. And so I do think there are things that you can do um, with drama that um, sort of make it worthwhile and sort of, you know, in where you can transcend the documentary form in a very meaningful way. Um, you know, I shouldn't say this because I haven't seen it, but you know, and it's a, and you know, I don't know how it works. For instance, that they do a whole episode where you know it's the Bronco chase, but it's him in the Bronco, which is again the opposite conceit in terms of how we all experience this, and that sort of also that's part of the drama, which was us as viewers. I'm sure that was part of it, but then you're like, well, no one ever experienced that, so that's what you can do. Now, I don't know if that experience is sort of dramatically um, resonant in, in a way that sort of you're watching, like, oh my God, I never knew this. But it also, I'm sure it feels pretty false. 
um, because it's like, who knows what was going on and what sort of the, the emotional sort of, you know, content of that, that vehicle. And it, it probably, you know, it's the same way in a case like this, you know, Cuba Gooding Jr., as great of an actor as he is, he's not O.J. Simpson. And so I don't know how you can sort of, you know, beat reality when you have someone who is that charismatic and that charming and, you know, and good looking. And so in that way, you know, real life is always going to beat fiction. Hi, my name's Cal. I'm a sophomore studying sociology. You kind of just touched on this, but are there any subjects or perspectives that you wish you could have gotten besides Chris Darden and OJ himself uh, that you weren't able to get? Sure, tons. Um, but a lot of them are people that I kind of knew I wouldn't. Um, you know, I, the person I would have wanted to talk to more than anybody else was his first wife, uh, Marguerite, um, but she's never really talked to anybody, and we couldn't even find her. Um, and so she would have been number one, because I think she probably could shed a lot more light on who O.J. was and is than O.J. would himself. Um, you know, Al Cowlings, obviously, but again, someone who has never done an interview um, since this, um, since the Bronco chase, and has been offered m literally millions of dollars to do interviews. Um, Essentially, anybody that was, you know, you know, still close to OJ and, and a part of his inner circle were people that um, I knew would be, you know, near impossible to get to talk. And we sort of tried our best to get to a place where everyone knew we were doing this and to have everyone officially say no to us. But we, you know, outside of, you know, his agent who is in the film, but again, he's someone who is sort of broken with OJ and is... is um, written about his experiences with him, there really was no access to anybody in his inner circle. So that, that sort of, and so that's why Darden, as you know, reluctant as I knew he would be to talk, sort of the idea I felt there was still sort of, because he's still a public figure, um, I thought there was a chance that he would say yes. So I have a question about uh, the arc of justice in, in the film, because clearly we, we know that O.J. committed this terribly violent act, but in the context of the racial tensions of the time, there's some understanding about why the jury did what it did. Then there's the second trial when he's uh, convicted of, um, of some sort of uh, charged with some sort of financial damages that he then has to Pay to the, the civil trial. Yeah. The, the civil trial. trial. Yeah. And, and then there's the final trial right. when he's convicted of a lot of things. A lot of different yeah. things. And and as I understood it, what I thought you were saying at the end was he was given a much more severe sentence for that final trial than he might have otherwise <coughs> because of the first trial. So, is, is that good or bad or, or you know? That's, that's for you to decide. Seriously. Or is, he, is it a black man again being stuck in, in some sort of injustice? In the uh, I think it just speaks to the nature of what justice is. It's not justice, you know? It's, uh, and it's one more, one more sort of instance where our criminal justice system, in my mind, doesn't work the way it's supposed to. It's another instance where, you know, it's proof that jurors are human beings. Um, but I, I truly, I don't mean that to be so, like, you know, cute. I mean, I do think it's, it's up to you to decide what that's all about. Um, you could, you can, inter and I think it can properly be interpreted in many ways. And so the notion, many people just look at it as karmic justice, which is not a real thing, but it's a real thing. So like, you know, but in terms of the greater commentary, I think you had, you know, not necessarily in the civil trial, but in the initial murder trial and that, you had two very different cases where the justice system failed as far as the actual case that they were arguing. So, I don't know. That's what I think. Um, I think we have time for a couple more. Yeah. Um, I was really struck by um, both the prosecution and the defense's coded language about the Santa Monica jury pool and the downtown jury pool. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how 
that euphemistic language about race plays into the national conversation today. I'm thinking of you know people in power who talk about the inner cities couldn't get worse. Uh, I uh, well, it's interesting because I sort of maybe I'm being maybe because I'm so used to actually much more coded language in many ways. I found that a lot of what you know certainly defense and especially Carl Douglas, um, who is the um, black lawyer on the on OJ's defense team, I thought he was about as uncoded as one could get in that form as far as talking about um, sort of who they wanted. Um, on the jury and how they went about selecting them. Um, I do think that's just a very basic sense of, I, 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 don't, I can't answer your question in terms of the relation to you know, how we talk about um, race today and language that's used other than this, we've become you know, increasingly political, politically correct in how we um, discuss such things. Um, but I actually think that the thing that's sort of, again, something that was surprising to me was how open they were about talking about the way that they frankly were, um, you know, trying to manipulate a jury pool to, you know, on racial, you know, on a racial level to get what they wanted. And, may, and maybe I'm so in it that I sort of, though the language that was used, maybe, maybe it is more coded than I thought, because I thought they were pretty open. <clears throat> I haven't yet seen the movie, but uh, obviously we'll want to after this. But I'm just curious in terms of how the documentaries when you especially went around folk trying to get an interview with someone who may not want to do it, where does money come into that? Did you pay anybody? No. Um, do you, is that? It's not a starter. If someone wants money and that's, uh, then we won't interview them. Um, I'm sort of very old school in that way. Um, you don't pay people for their story. Um, I mean, by the way, I know a lot of people who do pay subjects and I don't sort of, and I don't think it ends up necessarily, it's all, it has to do with the type of movie you're making too. You know, there are people who get paid who are subjects of films, and it's about them. That's a different thing. Does that influence sort of what they give, how they give it? I have no idea. Um, it's not something that I'm comfortable with, personally. Hi, um, my name is Heather, and interior. I work in events, but I studied film in uh, in college. And um, I remember when uh, director Gus Van Sant got nominated for an Academy Award. He didn't want to do Good Will Hunting, has absolutely no interest. But he had always wanted to do a remake of Psycho. And whether that was the best idea or not, um, he used that as Good Will Hunting as a ticket to be able to do what he wanted to do. And I was wondering, since you did mention that you had first passed on it, is there a pet project that you always want to do that you just wish you could, but no one would like back it? Or? No. Um... No, no, uh, no. I, I, I don't. No, uh, I, I don't. I, don't, I can't really explain how I end up doing the things that I do. Um, I've been fortunate to um, have opportunities to do things sometimes through people asking me to do them or bringing them to me, or and it's sort of a weird process. I think maybe it has to do with how obsessive I get when I do it, which isn't that pleasant in doing it. So I'm reluctant to do anything. Um, so I, I don't know, I don't have those, yes, it makes perfect sense. And if there were theoretically a moment where I'd be able to, you know, maybe make a film that I, that was, I was very passionate about, this would be it. But, um, unfortunately, I don't have that. I think that's a good serendipitous note to end on. Great serendipitous.